is the beginning of the fifth Brandenburg concerto of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. The Brandenburg, I had the uh, privilege or the honor of someone giving me um, um, their Brandenburg concerto tickets over Christmas. So Dave and I went to see uh, the Lincoln Center Chamber Players, where they did all six of the Brandenburg concerti. Uh, there are six of them. Two in the key of F, two in the key of G, one in the key of D, and one in the key of B flat. And the words, it's very clear the Brandenburgs are here to stay. So, uh, anyway, uh, that's the way I remember them. But anyway, um, the, the Brandenburg and Charity are arguably the beginning of the orchestra. Bach wrote, you know what a concerto is. A concerto is, is, is a piece for solo instrument backed up by many other instruments. Well, I like a concerto, a well, piano concerto we think of as a piano with a bit full orchestra behind it. But in Bach's day, um, he was starting these concerti, which is the plural, of course. These concerti were small pieces for small chamber groups. Um, and if the Lincoln Center players, they had 21 players that covered everything. But um, there are certain things that are consistent. There is always a continuo part, which is the, ba the basso continuo, which is a double bass, usually, and, and, uh, the ch and a cello often plays along that part, too. And uh, they have something magical, which is called figured bass. And the harpsichord, or cembalo, or whatever instrument, sometimes organ, occasionally piano, whatever keyboard instrument is playing along, basically fills the chords in the same way that jazz player does. But instead of saying C7, it's going to, it's going to say C, and it's going to have a seven mark. So it, just, it would just have a C in the cello part and a seven. But if it has a, if it has nothing, you play a regular chord. If it has a, 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 a six four, you play this chord over the C. If it has six three, you play this chord. Over the so in a sense, the numbers they were talking about were the degrees of the scale, but they were representing the chords that were being played. And the cembalo player or the or the or the harpsichord player would play very much like a jazz player would play his own version of the harmonies. They weren't written out. He was looking at the cello part with little numbers. So in, the, in, instead of our C7, F, F7, you know, uh, G9, he was using the symbols over the bass line that said 3, 6, 4, 6, 3, and various degrees. So in a sense, the harpsichord player and the bass player, they were the rhythm section for these. So the other thing that Bach did in the concerto is generally had strings as backup, but every single one of these has a different set of solo instruments. So there's horns and trumpets, there's, there's the one with three oboes and, and, and bassoon, there's, there are different sets of configurations. This particular one that we were just talking about that I was just playing for you, the, the D major concerto, is um, a piece that, that where the soloists are solo violin, solo flute, and interestingly enough, the harpsichord is, is one of the solo instruments in this. So um, I, I'm just setting myself up here for what's coming up, so pardon me if I'm a little distracted. But the, um, the great thing about uh, the, one of the things I've, that had to do with heritage for me with this was when I was play, listening to the Brandenburg Concertos, I was realizing that I used to use the, the cadenza from the concertos in my warm up for about three years. Because Bach is a great warm up because it exercises both sides of the brain. You know, the one hand is more or less dominated by one half of the brain, the opposite side supposedly. In Bach, they really have to talk to each other because the left hand is not just playing in papa or bass notes, it's playing the same kind of lines and config configurations that the right hand is trading off, it's imitative music. So the left hand is as busy as the right, and is ornamented. Now, now, a couple things about Bach. First of all, on the harpsichord, the harpsichord, as, as I think it was uh, Sir John Barbaroli, maybe it was Thomas Beach, and I think it was John Barbaroli, he had, a, he had a better sense of humor, who said that the, the sound of the harpsichord is basically two skeletons fornicating on a tin roof. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what the harpsichord is. And I listened to some of these performances, and sometimes the coupling, some of them, they would couple and they'd be muddy, or they would, they would straight, straight through in quick tempo. Um, but in the day, one of the things that you can't, the, the way the harpsichord works is different from the piano. The piano is a hammer that hits a string. Right, so the hammer is directly connected to the way I strike this key. If I strike it slowly, or easily, or even easier, you get a very soft tone. If I hit it hard, or quickly, you get a louder tone. 
Not so on the harpsichord. The harpsichord has these little things called plectars, which are little pieces of generally leather attached to pieces of wood. The wood goes by the string, and this little leather thing kind of, and this is the string goes, so it plucks it like, like, like a guitar pick. And it's a little bit flexible, so when it leans against the string, as soon as it clears it, it, it plucks it, and then it's clear. And when it comes back down, it deadens it again. So um, uh, the harpsichord, the thing is that you, it doesn't matter how hard you hit that note, the collector is not gonna make the string sound significantly louder. So the evenness of those notes is part of the instrument. You can't change that as you can on a piano. Now when we play Bach on a piano, we naturally kind of tend to phrase a little bit. We tend to, we tend to play uh, you know, into, the, into the stronger notes and the higher notes, the stress notes on the piano. And, and that, of course, got a little extreme in the, in the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, because people were playing Bach like it wasn't really Bach anymore, I think. But, um, but in the day of this, the way that you would sometimes get an accent was called an agogic accent. So an agogic accent is something where you slow down, perhaps, and emphasize the, the important point, not by s amount of sound, but by length of sound. You can go, you know. See that little pause that I put there? It was the cadence. It was the landing of the cadence that made that so interesting. And uh, so that's all over the Bach music, the, the, the gogic accent. And the, the differences of playing, because clarity is important. When you play in the piano and you're playing um, this music, you really shouldn't use pedal. And, and some people pedal suddenly in Bach. I, I just think it's better not to. But the, um, um, I'm going to tell, show you how this cadenza goes. Now, like I said, this was my kind of my, my warm-up piece. Uh, and this, as I said, I'm going now. Now, Mark Janis will play the Quran. No. Um, <laughs> so I have a long part. But um, and I'm surprised it did come back. It took a little uh, a little doing this week, but it did kind of get back to my fingers. It's certainly not what it was but years ago when I was playing it every day as a warm-up. But this cadenza appears in the middle of the piece, and what happens? The orchestra is going, and the, and the cadenza set, suddenly starts. It, these long scales that go in the harpsichord and go up and down the keyboard, and then finally the orchestra cuts out, and and the, and the harpsichord takes off by itself and plays a cadenza. At a certain point, the harpsichord comes to a big cadence where it doubles up, almost like it has its own cadenza within the cadenza, and it, and it goes double speed for a while, and then it leads back into into the ending. Um, so this is how this cadenza goes on the piano, and and it's a, a fascinating um, a fascinating exercise in what can be done in broke music, because in broke music there's so many things called sequences, you know. Sequences is taking a figure, you know. So moving, moving the same configuration down keys or up keys is called a sequence. It's also used a lot in, in, uh, in impressionist music. They call it planing sometimes. but, but uh, these sequences are good. But this is the, one of the most amazing little pieces of music, and it was a great warm up. So, this is the cadenza from the fifth Brandenburg Concerto of Bach. Me. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Would come in and join at that point. So I'm going to finish off by just playing you the lead in to that cadenza and we'll let you hear what it sounds like in the harpsichord. It's quite thrilling. This is Claudio Lotto conducting.
time to the box. So please give them a listen. It, it, you know, this is the greatest music to clean house you ever. Yeah. <laughs> Any of the brand works. I'm telling you, you got, you got a chore to do around the house, you got a full lot. Put on a brand new show. It's just a little spirit. Have a great break. Thank you.